I want to talk up to you about how leading customers or leading enterprises are, are dealing with di digital transformation and managing this uh, fast data containerization and hybrid clouds uh, uh, challenge that we're, we're all kind of faced with uh, today. Uh, by show of hands, who here is more on the developer side of the house versus the infrastructure operations? Oh, sorry, uh, developers first. Okay, good chunk. And then uh, infrastructure operations? Okay, so that, that's, that's useful. <laughs> um, that, that'll help me kind of, uh, this is a lot of develop, uh, developer-minded uh, uh, folks here in the audience. What I'd like to do is kick off with uh, driving some clarity around the definitions of cloud, because I think a lot of people have different views of what cloud is. It's different things for, to different people. Uh, the second thing I'll talk through, what are, the mech what, what are some uh, common uh, behavior patterns uh, for enterprises that we work with, including some, some market research? And then lastly, close with uh, some of the capabilities that a software-driven cloud platform can provide, and what are some customers uh, doing with, those, with, with, uh, with that technology? So let's get started. Um, cloud, good word or bad word? Who thinks it's a good word? Really? All right. Who thinks it's a bad word? OK. So the rest of you is half thought it was a good word. The rest thought it was not a, not a bad word. Um, so everybody else is somewhere in between, which I think that makes a lot of sense. right? I think if you're thinking about cloud, you're probably using cloud because it's easy to use. It's fast to get started. And you don't have to think about calling people to get stuff done because it's just going to be there for you, right? I think as, as we think about the ways in which people are using cloud, I would propose there's three definitions we should always think about. The first is the sourcing model. Who's running the infrastructure, right? In the old days, back in the 90s, it was around IT outsourcing uh, and reducing costs. Um, and a lot of uh, organizations in the late 90s decided to offshore a lot of development work uh, into lower cost countries. Uh, just so happens to be the time when I stopped being a developer. Um, the second piece is the operating model, right? Can you, uh, with a few mouse clicks, get a service, get something going for you, right? Uh, and this is, if the left was driven by outsourcing, the middle was driven by, I think, virtualization. Because prior to virtualization, any time a developer wanted a piece of a database or, or operating system, somebody from infrastructure ops had to get up out of their seats and, and make it available to them, right? Rack a server, plug things up. But virtualization made it so that you can just very easily, with a few mouse clicks, you know, get a database or get a virtual machine. But I think, since we're mostly developers here, a virtual machine by itself, is it useful? Kind of? Right? Ideally, you want some services on top on which you can do development. And this is where PaaS became more of a thing. But as we move forward to today, uh, a lot of the companies are moving towards what we, we now call, what we now call uh, cloud-native architectures. And cloud-native architectures were basically first developed at the companies like Google and Facebook right, around 10 years ago when they were dealing with scalability challenges and challenges around performance. So they said, why don't we take our applications, re-architect them into uh, commodity hardware, and rebuild our applications towards microservices? Uh, and now it's really becoming the model in which many people are looking to build new applications. The reason I break, break these three concepts out apart is because um, sometimes, I think in this space, we kind of commingle them all together, right? Because people might, some people might think, well, to get cloud-native services, to use Kubernetes, to use Kafka, to use all these machine learning tools, I must go to cloud provider X, right? Or it must be hosted by somebody else. And I would propose that this isn't necessarily the case. And the case in point, when uh, cloud first became a word, I was at VMware at the time, uh, we were thinking, wow, if cloud just means public cloud services, uh, we're not gonna really have a business around virtualization. Right? So VMware coined the term private cloud, which is giving you the software to get that self-service provisioning that you get from a public cloud. Right? And then Gartner, uh, a few years later, after we, we, we really pushed on delivering the software, um, a, a leading Gartner analyst said, private cloud is a thing. Get over it. Because it, it is something that you can get 
even though it's not run by somebody else. And I think that true is actually same, the, the, the same for cloud-native architectures. You can use software to get cloud-native architectures uh, available to your development teams on demand, right? And you can run it yourself, whether it be uh, on an edge environment, a data center environment, or uh, a cloud provider environment where you're just using the IS. So th that's, that's the, the context in terms of defining cloud. Now, to find the right approach to, to tackle building these next generation applications, to enable uh, personalized uh, experiences, to do machine learning and fraud detection, you know, what are the right things you should be thinking about uh, to, to tackle that appropriately? Uh, this is so some high level stuff, right, from Gartner. They did some research around interviewing CIOs. Are you worried about new entrants coming in and taking your business away? And it turns out almost 70% of IT leaders, for them, it's a, it's a concern, right? Medium or high concern. And when Gartner asked, well, what are you doing about it? Uh, the response ranges from, I'm gonna have a separate all-in approach on transforming or transformation projects to, well, I'm gonna just really focus on um, reducing costs for running existing applications or a combination of both. The first piece is really about uh, driving cost optimizations. The, the bottom piece here, transform, uh, actually oftentimes means we're gonna roll out a new project that's about uh, building new applications from the cloud not necessarily transforming how the business model is working. So what that means is that you end up with isolated projects, and it shouldn't be surprising to us in a large company with many different projects going on, if you have an isolated, uh, isolated transformation project that is not really shifting your business model, a lot of them are not gonna be successful, right? So it, it, my recommendation in, in this area is as you think about building new applications, uh, ideally, you find a way to pull it all together where you're, you're, you're simultaneously tackling the uh, optimization of existing um, applications and how you run them and also investing in uh, how you're uh, getting into uh, new applications. Well, how do you do this? For most companies, most of your spend is actually in running existing stuff, right? A very small amount of your money, typically an enterprise, is focused on transforming the business. And a lot of companies have projects internally to say, hey, we're gonna really tone up the transformation piece and reduce the costs required to run existing applications. But the reality is uh, a lot of companies are dealing with existing comp uh, new competitors that are coming into their space that are using different types of technologies. They don't have this, uh, this legacy infrastructure to worry about, right? And that's, you see this in every space from insurance to retail, right? Companies that don't have existing things to worry about come in with an approach where they're all in on spending money to get to more personalized experiences and getting to a more uh, cloud-native approach. So companies, ideally, you find a, a platform or a software approach that can simultaneously reduce the cost required to run, but also be a force multiplier to, to, to really drive your transformation. And the reason I say this is it's not just about getting a piece of technology and using it. It's finding other software tools that can automate how you run those technologies, because it's gonna be shifting very, very quickly, which I'll get into next. So the trifecta that a lot of the companies that I talk to, that they're trying to get to, and I'll walk through some customer examples uh, in just a couple of slides, is getting towards containerized microservices, so you're building applications and containers, so you can ship those applications or new features more quickly. You wanna be able to have backing data services so that you can Number one, stop paying Oracle tons of money. <laughs> Number two, be able to uh, build data-driven applications that are reactive, can be, that are predictive, right, and, and take advantage of machine learning. And third, of course, your customers are everywhere, right? So you can't have all this data only sitting in a data center. Ideally, you want to be able to run and host these services for multiple environments, uh, including the edge. So um, in the early days, and what does this mean? This means that your enterprise architecture is shifting from just building monolithic applications to host existing users, which are usually employees for an enterprise. So as a developer in the late 90s and early 2000s, at Oracle, I built applications that sat against the Oracle database that was used largely by internal um, employees and our customers. But now, most enterprises are dealing with what's on the right here, right, which is 
your, your customers, the users of your applications are not just employees, but they're actually endpoints, they're customers that are directly interacting with your product or service. So the days of shipping a product and not hearing from the customer until there's a service request, you know, that's gonna go the way of the dinosaur. Most companies wanna build services so that they can use that interaction with the customer to let, generate data and then create uh, new services uh, from that. To do this, the early web scale companies you know, figured out, well, we gotta, we gotta scale things out. We gotta turn things into microservices. So this is your code, the business logic that runs your business, right? The applications that, that becomes a front end of your services. But to power those services, you're gonna be using a ton of data services, which most enterprises will not be building themselves, right? Most enterprises will be using a Kafka that was invented at LinkedIn, using Cassandra that was in, uh, invented at Facebook. They're not gonna be creating their own data service. They're gonna use what the industry or the open source ecosystem has created for them. But ideally, they can host and run these services uh, on any infrastructure they want. So the reality for most enterprises today is you have to do the left and the right, right? You can't spend most of your money on the left and expect to be able to handle the right side really well. And if you don't believe me, let's walk through what this looks like, right? So the, the level of complexity for most enterprises today has really shifted a lot. From just managing virtual machines, running databases and tra traditional end-tier application or LAMP stack, to now actually running, just for an example, uh, a modern data-driven application that includes analysis, serving the application, storing the databases or the information, and transporting that data between endpoints. And the reason why this chart, by the way, has a lot of images that are different colors, it's not because Ed doesn't like colors to match on a presentation. It's actually because these images come from different ecosystems, different communities that have their own approach on how they describe, document, draw, lay out how do you run these services. All right, so if, you're, if, you're, if you thought this was complicated, this is your new world, right? So either A, you say, okay, I'm just gonna use a cloud provider, I'm gonna outsource this, or you find a way to, to do it yourself in a highly automated way. Um, and if that didn't seem complicated enough, these four technologies, Spark, Kubernetes, uh, Cassandra, and Kafka, are just a small minority of what's out there in the cloud native ecosystem. I actually highlighted those here in red, right? And for most enterprises, there, there's gonna be a lot of different developers that wanna use a lot of different things over here. And the question becomes, how do you make all this run together? So I know there's, we're mostly developers here in this house, so it's probably not your problem, it's somebody else's problem, but to be able to give this to you in a way that's easy for you to use, I think is actually important uh, and, and this is why, why we're talking about this today. Okay, so in the context of all these complicated applications or application technologies that people are looking to run, you know, how are people running these today? Well, because uh, Mesosphere, we happen to sit at a very low level uh, of the infrastructure. Uh, we sit basically right between the, the hardware which is below us, and also uh, below uh, services like Kubernetes, Kafka, Cassandra, and so forth, we're able to get a bird's eye view when we survey our customers what they're running, where they're running it, uh, and get a sense of how they're adopting it over time. So this is a uh, output from our Mesos, uh, uh, Mesosphere Cloud Native Ecosystem Survey that includes data from 2016 and 2018. You can see that you know, people talk about hybrid cloud, and that's definitely a thing that's happening, right? For the first time, in Mesosphere's uh, ecosystem or a community, we're seeing more people running hybrid than cloud only. We're also seeing that uh, all cloud providers are getting, seeing more adoption, including AWS, but the majority of the growth is actually with companies like uh, Azure and other, which includes uh, Ali Cloud and so forth. So that's where people are running in terms of on-prem or cloud. In terms of which cloud providers people are using, uh, I was very surprised to find that Today, one out of four uh, users of Mesosphere technology are running on multiple clouds, All right? So people don't just want one cloud provider. They want to have the ability to move workloads uh, between cloud providers and have portability. Now, that's where they run. What kind of stuff are they running on? Well, it's a, it's a mix. 
It includes microservices, uh, includes legacy applications. These are your traditional Java apps, for example. Uh, and of course, uh, data services, ML, uh, and CI CD tools. So that's the, the broad level classification. And on the right side of the page, you're looking at telemetry data or download statistics of when people use our platform, what are they choosing to run? And you can see that Kafka has seen an explosion in terms of adoption, um, and so has Kubernetes. So uh, one other thing I'll add here is uh, the hybrid cloud adoption actually can vary by industry. Um, who's surprised to find that the number one hybrid adopter is actually in retail? Is that surprising? Everybody saw that? <laughs> so, um, you know, there's a lot of theories on why this is the case, but one possibility is that if you are a online, if you're a retailer, you're, you're probably not gonna go all in on this provider right here because you wanna have options, right? And, and I've actually talked to customers that have told me that, right? We are not gonna go all in on AWS because they're trying to destroy us. So we're gonna be using some of the other cloud providers. But to do that, uh, we wanna make sure that, that we have a right software platform that can help us abstract how we use the different infrastructures from different cloud providers. Uh, another one that was surprising to me was healthcare uh, and pharmacy uh, and pharma. Uh, no respondents out of our survey uh, actually said they're doing um, cloud only. You know, it's always a combination of hybrid um, and on-prem. So that's what people are running. That's where people are running it. Um, now let's talk about how companies are looking at stitching all these different things together and why that's so important. Um, Mesosphere, our approach is to provide a automation layer and a resource management layer uh, that, that basically allows you to adopt any new technology, like the ones we sh I showed you earlier, and, and, and automate the operations of those technologies so you can run them on any type of infrastructure you want, including edge and multi-cloud uh, infrastructures. To do this, well, we're doing a couple of things. We're doing what VMware did for traditional monolithic applications, right? VMware essentially abstracted, pooled, and automated how you run monolithic apps. Mesosphere is abstracting, pooling, and automating how you run modern distributed services, except automating how you run Kubernetes, for example, is, is very different than how you automate just getting a VM up and running, right? So the technology needs to be a little bit different, actually very different, <laughs> but um, I'll, I'll walk through some examples of that. So the, 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 the reason why you wanna do this is instead of having cluster proliferation, because all of these technologies that you guys leverage as developers are actually distributed systems, and they were never actually designed to share infrastructure, right? They're cloud-native technologies. They expect a bunch of VMs available on demand and, and be able to run resources on it. Um, if you put a lot of these things together, uh, there'll just be resource contention. You know, Spark will kill Kafka or vice versa, right? And things won't work well. And, and what Mesosphere does is we use Apache Mesos as a technology to be a, level, a layer of indirection between uh, what the resources say they want and the computing resources that are available. On top, it's about knowing what are all the steps to run Kafka well, to run Kubernetes well. How do you do recovery? What are all the procedures you have to follow to automate that? On the bottom, it's about having resource awareness on does this server have a GPU? Does this server uh, sit on AWS? Is it, does the server local? And basically do a form of matching between the resources that are available and the workloads that need to run it. And I'll spend just two minutes on what this looks like. So this is an example from our user interface, right? We call this the donut view at Mesosphere. Every server here, or VM that's in the cloud, if you're running it in the cloud, is a donut. And Kubernetes here is running where all the reds are. So there's a lot of Kubernetes all over the place. There's a lot of Kafka, which are in purple, all over the place. If you didn't have a technology like Mesosphere, essentially each one of these color arcs would be its own server or its own VM in the cloud. So this is where a lot of consolidation uh, comes to play in terms of saving costs. Um, how this might look, right? Um, if you're running Kubernetes by yourself uh, or, or using a vendor that tells you to virtualize using virtual machines, uh, you're looking at one kubelet per OS, right? Um, and then data services is not really in scope. 
right? There's a lot of projects on how to bring it together, and Mesosphere is actually uh, as part of that conversation, but right now it's not something that can be done very easily. Uh, the Mesosphere's approach today is actually pulling all these clusters together, right? So you can have multiple cubelets in one server, sharing uh, multiple agents from Spark, sharing multiple agents from Kafka. And so as the workloads go up and down, just through the law of large numbers, we're able to pull those resources and give you more efficiency. Uh, the second piece is uh, automation, right? If you want to be able, I was talking to a bank the other day. They're a large bank. They have 100 people worldwide trying to figure out how do you adopt Kubernetes in your enterprise? Like, that's a lot of developers trying to figure out, or DevOps folks trying to figure out how do you, how do, you do this? Uh, and what we've done at Mesosphere is because we want to make it easy for people to adopt these new technologies, we've turned it into a very simple step. Right? This example is just for installation, but the same is actually true for upgrade, for uh, failover, uh, for all types of things uh, that you would do for day two operations of this technology. So the next screen is going to be a, a quick animated GIF on how all this works, and it moves pretty fast, so I'll talk you through it first. There's a service catalog. You type Kubernetes. Kubernetes shows up. You click it, and then it's autom automatically um, stood up for you. That's in a highly, a highly available and secure way. So here we go. Oops. Looks like the uh, animated GIF already ran its course, so I'll, I'll just reset it. Animated GIFs are not working. OK. All right. So <laughs> all right. We'll skip this. Um, but um, the, the, the point in this uh, piece is to show you that from a single user interface, you say, I want Kubernetes. And all these steps here are automatically done for you across the infrastructure on a particular region you want. So you can say, I want it on AWS, or I want it on US West, or I want it on this rack, if you define the regions appropriately. And then all those steps are actually taken care of for you so that you get, you get a cup of coffee or you call your friends, and then you, you have this, right? Pure, upstream, open source, Kubernetes that's completely and automatically um, managed for you as a service. The third piece um, is around multi-cloud. A lot of our customers are, as I mentioned earlier, running on multiple clouds. So how do you get consistency? There are, I think, according to CNCF, over 70 different ways to run Kubernetes right now. Just, and that's documented by the CNCF. So if you're a company that is seeing a lot of Kubernetes coming up all over the place, how do you make sure they're consistently configured? How do you make sure that they're upgraded consistently? How do you make sure that you're maintaining them in a secure way? Ideally, you're using software to automate that for you across your enterprise, across different infrastructures. And, and that's what the automation I talked about here, combined with a large number of Kubernetes clusters that you might cover here, becomes very powerful for, for folks. Um, let's see, there we go. So this animated GIF that works is a live migration of workloads. It's a copy of our DCOS website, uh, seeing a live migration from AWS to Azure. So AWS right now, go to settings, placement, change AWS to Azure, and then uh, review and run. And there's a little fast forwarding here, but essentially we stage, launch, run those, uh, agent, th those, uh, those microservices on uh, Azure, and then the rest is done. So, my point of showing this is not because it's fun to just do live migrations all the time between clouds, but to show you that uh, if, you're a if you're a company that cares about multi-cloud operability, you're having a capability like this means you can better set up uh, multi-cloud uh, disaster recovery situations, uh, have more portability in terms of where you want to run. Um, and so one example of a customer that we had, they're a logistics company based in San Jose. They're moving to Asia. And there are requirements there around using specific cloud providers. So they wanted to use Ali Cloud. They're able to take their entire application stack, move it to Ali Cloud, uh, and get going. And the same is actually true for uh, other uh, companies as well. So that's a view of what people are doing from a, from a data perspective, what surveys tell us. 
uh, a view of the capabilities people are using to be able to have multi-cloud operations of data services and microservices. Uh, now let's walk through some customer examples just to see, give you a flavor of what people are doing. Uh, I'll start off with Athena Health. So they're a uh, healthcare company that's doing a lot of data-driven uh, applications that they're, they're trying to build data-driven applications for today's end users. A lot of existing data sitting on Oracle databases. And it's actually quite hard to develop applications that allow customers to easily look up a, a local doctor in their region using their traditional uh, Oracle databases uh, without a lot of performance uh, degradation. Right? You have to wait like, like tens of seconds to get a, uh, a, a query like that uh, answered. So what they've done is they're using Spark to analyze the Oracle database. They're using Kafka to transfer uh, for that output to a public cloud where they essentially have a data fabric on which they can build uh, uh, a data fabric that's essentially centered around a graph database and they can build new data-driven applications to very easily query uh, uh, different types of information for solving specific things around doctor services and patient services. So that's Athena Health. Um, my, my favorite example is actually Royal Caribbean. If I asked you, what is the largest distributed computing cluster in the world by geography, nobody's gonna say Royal Caribbean, right? But what they've actually done is create a, a edge deployment use case Who's been in the cruise in the last couple of years? Okay, wow, good number of cruisers around here. So I haven't been on a cruise for a while, but 10 plus years ago, it was every morning you get a sheet of paper under your door that says, today's activities are blah. And if you wanna do this activity, please line up here so you can get the uh, glacier tour or snorkeling tour or whatever it is. That's a very archaic way, I think you guys agree, of trying to upsell your, your customers on services you have. So what they've done at World Caribbean is they're rolling out to their entire fleet of ships uh, a data-driven application so that uh, everything's actually on your mobile device, right? So ideally, when you're checking in uh, to World Caribbean, you're actually planning and booking your trip. Uh, they know your preferences, right? Uh, by the time you get onto the ship, um, data is also, also being transferred. Even when you see a, do a ship that's uh, docked, you see goods and services coming out. But what you do also don't see is, is satellite information about the new set of passengers going in and then pulling down the passenger information for the folks who are leaving. And the reason for this is when the ship's at sea, all that satellite communication is actually being used by customers to Skype with grandpa and grandma and, and do all these things that customers do on a cruise ship. And so the entire data-driven application has to be hosted entirely on the ship, right? So whether the Wagyu beef is, uh, upgrade is available, whether scuba diving is available, why, whether um, you know, there are campaigns where they're trying to upgrade you to different meal plans, those are all things that have to be done entirely on the ship itself, on a completely autonomous infrastructure where there's no sysadmins because you know, a cruise line is not gonna pay a bunch, of, a bunch of sysadmins just to maintain a server when most of the time the, the, the server should actually run itself, right? So these data services are completely automated and it allows Royal Caribbean to take their existing fleet, which includes ships that are sometimes decades old and give customers a very modern data-driven experience that you might expect from Uber, Twitter, and Airbnb. So that's Royal Caribbean. And then uh, T-Mobile, uh, another one of our customers doing some exciting things. Um, in, in, in this case, it's, uh, it's their European division. And what they've done is they built an application that you can download on your mobile device, and it will help you automatically switch between whether your phone is using a Wi-Fi device for connectivity or cell towers. And apparently, um, this application has thousands of stars on the App Store, which to me is quite interesting, because when was the last time a telco had an app in an App Store where everybody loved it? <laughs> Uh, but in this case, it's actually improving the customer experience. It's reducing network congestion for the telco. And so it, it's been very positive uh, for T-Mobile. Uh, China Unicom, a slightly different use case. Um, China is very large, in case you didn't know. Right? So in, in China Unicom, there's at least 30 different regions where they're doing uh, billing uh, and, and all the processing for different people's uh, uh, phone bills. And what they've done is modernize that infrastructure to run on a stretched DCOS cluster. So they're running 30 different regions, all managed by DCOS. And they're able to uh, more effectively process uh, the, their, their billing 
much more quickly than before, and according to them, saving essentially $1 million uh, per region or $30 million uh, in terms of uh, annual spend. So uh, I'll close with maybe uh, one more. So this is a very large European car manufacturer that um, is doing some exciting things around connected car and electric vehicles. And one of their uh, mapping partners, um, uh, the company is called here, formerly Navtech, is actually also using DCOS separately. What they're doing is actually providing an infrastructure on which you can connect with uh, vehicles. Right? As I said earlier, the days of selling a vehicle or a product and not hearing back from the customer until there's a problem, that's over. Ideally, you're using the telemetry information to better engage with your customers, and that's what this company is exactly doing. Um, to provide better performance and reduce latency, uh, a lot of the services are actually uh, hosted uh, on, on the telco's infrastructure, and then it goes back to the corporate infrastructure uh, for different types of information. And then for mapping information, it's actually going to, to here. Uh, last one I'll go through and uh, I'll, I'll close. Uh, this is a large bank, one of the, I think, five largest banks in, in the world. Uh, and they're essentially uh, leveraging our platform to allow different BUs to process information on shared infrastructure. So whether you're a transactional type of use case or you're doing an analytical type of use case, you're sharing infrastructure, right? Which is good from a performance perspective, but over time it helps different BUs to pollinate information with other BUs. Imagine if uh, corporate investment banking can leverage uh, information from retail banking in terms of customer behaviors and so forth to better inform their next move as an investment bank. Right? Those are all things that are more possible when you, when you, when you use a, a software layer to automate operations for all these different technologies that we're talking about. Okay, so um, I went through a lot of stuff, right? We talked about uh, disambiguating uh, what cloud means. We talked about um, the requirements for many enterprises to drive digital transformation successfully. And then we also talked about how a software layer can automate operations for a lot of these different cloud native technologies like Kubernetes, Spark, Kafka, and, and so on. The list goes on. Um, and then we close with some customer examples. So uh, in closing, the, the thing I want us to all kind of think about as we go and change the world with software, right, is to, to really ask yourself, uh, how, how are we making the right decisions with respect to cloud? If you are, uh, any company that's telling you the sourcing model, the operating model, and the cloud native architectures, those, those are decisions that cannot be separated from each other. If, if that's what you're hearing, then somebody probably has something to sell you, right? So a case in point, um, are you guys familiar with Rackspace? So Rackspace's operating margins, last I heard, was around uh, 10 to 13 percent. Um, and that's just basically for your infrastructure as a service, VMs on demand, right? Anybody know AWS's operating margins? 27 percent, right? So AWS takes IaaS, takes a lot of open source technologies, and some of them they build in-house, right? But a lot of it's open source. And they're able to command probably 35 percent operating margins for a blended, if you combine that with, let's say, 10, 13, you end up with a, the 27. So I said earlier, a lot of these technologies are very complex. Uh, that is, is coming through. So all this stuff, lots of slides here, all this stuff and running all of this is so hard that Amazon's able to charge people a lot of money for it. So that's what's happening. Right? So if you're able to use a software layer, whether it's open source or bought from a vendor, to automate all of this so that you can basically get this, automate this with software, instead of giving AWS or another cloud provider 40, 35, 40% operating margin, you're able to take that money and invest it in your, home, in your own company to build your own IT center of, uh, of excellence to build your next uh, digital transformation project. So that's the first thing I wanted you guys to, to, to kind of take away is that the, how you run, where you run in terms of sourcing, um, how you automate, and 
um, what type of architectures you're running are, are independent decisions you can make on your own with software. The second piece we talked about is essentially, you know, you shouldn't, ideally you're thinking about your transformation efforts holistically, not just, hey, we're gonna do digital transformation and that means taking our existing apps or existing services and putting a website or a mobile user app in front of it, right? That's not gonna change much. But if you find new ways to run existing applications, let's say modernizing your Java enterprise applications, instead of paying a lot of money to, uh, for a virtualization layer, you know, reduce the cost through containerization and take that money towards data-driven applications. Now you get to a virtuous cycle. Uh, and then lastly, um, I just talked about uh, the way different companies are looking at uh, doing interesting things, from Royal Caribbean to connected car infrastructures to being able to offer a more personalized experience for users uh, through uh, data-driven applications. So think horizontally, right? Don't just think about the, the vertical silos that may be from a particular cloud provider, uh, and make sure the decisions you make are, are using cloud on your own terms. Thank you. I think we have time for questions. Yeah. Yes. Questions? There's one over here. Um, so um, one of the notes you had on multi-cloud usage, um, obviously disaster recovery is a big use case, but how often did you find or have you heard that the use case is uh, lock-in from a very specific feature or um, maybe platform that people want to develop on? So the, the question is how, whether people like lock-in, or we'll say that again. <laughs> Sorry, uh, you said that you were surprised that uh, how many companies had adopted multiple cloud solutions. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned disaster reco recovery, but did you find that beyond that, there were other motivations for, for that? Yeah, so I, I think there's different stages to, to multi-cloud. Um, just conceptually, there's, there's probably three stages, right? The first is just, do you have consistency? Do I, am I using something like vSphere so I could put it in this cloud or that cloud, right? That's kind of the first stage. Uh, the second stage is probably around just brokerage. Is there a platform that I can use that just takes this workload and just shoots it at the right cloud so I can continue building stuff on that cloud, right? Um, and the third uh, and the mo most sophisticated approach is a thinking of multiple clouds as a unified resource in which you can move workloads and, and do operations. I think many companies, uh, are, it's still pretty new to them because I think a lot of folks have heard about hybrid cloud and multi-cloud and unified operating models and people almost don't believe it anymore, right? That's why I feel compelled to show you guys a live migration between cloud providers to, 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 to show how it's possible. So yes, there are many customers that um, they're just stage one, if you will, is actually very useful to them because uh, if you are a connected car company and you're using AWS and EMEA and, and, uh, and uh, Americas for your connected car infrastructure, but you want to use Ali Cloud in China, right? How do you do that? Do you have a whole China division to rebuild this connected car infrastructure over there? Or do you use a piece of software layer like Mesosphere to take this whole thing and move it over there? So the short answer is, in terms of moving workloads really quickly between clouds, I don't, I don't think that's a big thing yet. But in terms of people wanting to be able to deploy in different regions where their cloud provider might not have the coverage that they want, or they want to do edge, as in the Royal Caribbean's case, for example, uh, this is where a software layer to do multi-cloud becomes very important. Any other questions? Bonjour. Um, Bonjour. Uh, my question is related to serverless and the lack of standardization in that space and normalization of the stack. Um, I'm trying to figure out in, in that context how, how you can migrate serverless uh, type of application between cloud provider, if my question makes sense. Um. So there's a couple of pieces to what you're talking about. Now, one is essentially service, serverless itself. Um, and there's a lot of debates out there on, will serverless actually overtake containerization? So that, Assuming it's right. And, and the reality I think is, you know, we don't know how that's gonna play out, right? But what we do know is that 
Enterprises are always going to need some type of underlying compute fabric that's very low level, right? And I don't mean container orchestration. I mean low level resource aggregation. And on top of that, there's always going to be different technologies that come and go, right? So when I, I've been at Mesosphere about four years at this point. When I started, it was around containerization. That then the Docker image format, right? the MP3 of the cloud native era became a thing, right? Uh, then it was the Smack stack, which is the replacement of the LAMP stack. Then it became Kubernetes. And now we're actually seeing a lot of data science workloads becoming more dominant, right? And, and serverless is actually nascent, but part of that, that, that transition. Um, I think once you have serverless up and running, the, the question becomes where you run it. And if you have a multi-cloud resource aggregator, it almost doesn't matter where you're running it. Right? So there's, there's still a lot of specifics to, to, to figure out, obviously. But um, jury's out. <laughs> I think it's still nascent right now. Yeah. I think right now it's pretty nascent is the short answer.